pleasant uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to all viewers and listeners to this YouTube channel. Once again, it's our pleasure to bring to you another episode of our work. And as promised to you last week, I said this year, 2024, we will be bringing important interviews to share with you. And this morning, I have been given the great privilege to be on the compound of the University of the West Indies. Actually, I am in the office of the director of the Cocoa Research Center and professor of genetics, Professor Minitinan Uma Haran, a Sri Lankan native who has made Trinidad and Tobago his second home, or we can safely say, as we say in local parlance, he's now a Trini to the board. However, more importantly, he has a wealth of knowledge and information to share with us. And just before I ask him to say a bit about himself, I remember the words of a, a former graduate of agriculture here at the University of the West Indies, Mr. Alpha Senon, who is the CEO of Y Farm. He said in one of his presentations that grass must be the new gas in Trinidad and Tobago. And when we look at the background of a, a food import bill of over $5 billion annually, certainly increasing cocoa production and other areas of agriculture is very important. So having said that, I would now like to ask the goodly professor to say a bit more about himself and for you to stay tuned and, and tap into his wealth of knowledge. Professor, could you tell the world a bit about yourself? Okay, I'm, uh, my name is uh, Patma Nathan Umaharan. I have been in Trinidad and Tobago since 1986. So I have, um, I'm probably, as you say, that I'm almost a native of um, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I have been lecturing at the university since 1991. Uh, the first 20 years, I worked at the Department of Life Sciences. Um, I started as a lecturer and moved up to a professor. And then from 2010 to now, I have been the director of the COCO Research Center. And it's been a privilege because COCO, I think, is one of the most uh, promising crops for Trinidad and Tobago. It offers a comparative advantage uh, to the country that no other agriculture crop offers. Um, one of the things I always say is that all our inputs into the cocoa industry is, is in terms of local uh, inputs, but all the revenue that we get is in terms of foreign exchange, right? So it, it's um, not only a has a comparative advantage because of our quality that we enjoy. Trinidad and Tobago has a reputation around the world as one of the producers of very, very fine cocoa. We export our cocoa to some of the ultra niche uh, cocoa markets at a very significant premium. And that is what offers our a comparative advantage. Trinidad and Tobago has been growing cocoa for almost 500 years. And, and we have a very long heritage as one of the first producers of cocoa in large estates. Before that, cocoa used to be only harvested from um, small um, forests and, and used to produce chocolate drinks in, in Central America. And um, so, in the, so this is where it was first planted, one of the first countries in which it was planted in a plantation scale to produce cocoa and export. And at one time, Trinidad was the third largest producer in the world, producing about 35,000 metric tons of cocoa and exporting it largely into the European market. But at present, you know, our industry has declined from producing 35,000 tons to producing maybe about 500 to 600 tons. And, uh, uh, and despite that, there is a tremendous opportunity, I would say, for the industry to be expanded. It creates employment. It provides environmental sustainability. Cocoa is grown, as you know, in, in the valleys of all the mountains in Trinidad. It uh, helps in terms of watershed management. It captures carbon. It provides soil conservation. It provides biodiversity convers 
conservation, and it provides food to the rural community. So it provides, in addition to the cocoa that it produces, it provides a whole lot of environmental and social functions, which is what is very important for the country. You know? So I think reviving the cocoa industry makes sense. It not only provides us opportunity to increase our foreign exchange earnings, but it also provides an opportunity to foster rural communities so that they become, they produce cottage industries around it and, and also create livelihoods, you know, that are healthier and um, more economically viable livelihoods. Um, the cocoa industry at the moment, um, as I said, produces about 500 to 600 tons. But what is more exciting is the evolution of a value-added industry. You know, so there are, uh, there are about 80 plus uh, chocolatiers who make um, chocolate products, uh, cocoa-based beverages, um, cocoa and rum, um, cocoa bitters, cosmetics, and so on. So there's a whole lot of industry around the cocoa farming sector that creates employment and opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago's. The, the value of cocoa is enormous because um, um, the cocoa in itself that we use to export, we, we fetch about 6,000 to 7,000 US um, per ton of cocoa that we produce. But if you convert it into value added products that you can get 70 to 80 times more value. So the so we, we always say that um, um, the value comes really from adding things, you know, through manufacturing and exporting and so on. So that is why I think we would like to take the cocoa industry too, from a primary producer of cocoa to a producer of value-added products, a range of them, and, uh, and moving them into the export market. Uh, I think we have about 35 million tourists coming into the Caribbean region. And we don't have a single cocoa-based product that we offer to the tourists who come in. You know? So even if each tourist buys one or few chocolate bars, we have an enormous market out there in the Caribbean. So I think this is our opportunities that we need to harness. And the Cocoa Research Center works in an ecosystem that involves the Ministry of Agriculture, that's the Cocoa Development Company of Trinidad and Tobago, and the Cocoa Research Center. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Cocoa Research Center itself. Certainly. Yeah, the Cocoa Research Center, we, we have three major mandates. The first mandate is conservation. Uh, Cocoa Research Center, I don't know, many of your uh, viewers may not know, that Trinidad and Tobago holds the largest cocoa varietal collection in the world. We have, we call that the International Cocoa Gene Bank. The International Cocoa Gene Bank has 2,300 cocoa varieties and is regarded as the Noah's Ark of cocoa. Mm -hmm. So the entire world relies on this resource that we actually manage in Trinidad and Tobago. So Trinidad and Tobago is not only famous on one hand for the cocoa we produce, mm -hmm. but also for the germplasm that we hold, mm -hmm. which is valuable for all cocoa producing countries. So, uh, so that's the first function. How do we preserve this collection, a very rare collection of these varieties for posterity? So that is conservation. So we have a 100 acre farm that is planted with these 2,300 plus varieties. The second mandate is research. You are now in the research center. Mm -hmm. This is where we do research along the whole value chain. How do you increase productivity to make farmers more profitable? How do you add value to the product? How do you manage risks associated with cocoa production? There are numerous risks. There's climatic risks. With climate change, you know, we are seeing changes in the environment. Um, we have pest and diseases, which take away about 40% of the production. Mm -hmm. um, we have other constraints such as parrots and so on. You know, the, so um, that, that's a second part, the research mandate. Mm -hmm. And the third mandate is, um, is about um, outreach, how do you build an industry by using the science and the genetic resources that we have? And, and that requires what we call an innovation center. So not too far from here in Mount Hope, mm -hmm. uh, we have set up what we call an innovation center, uh, which consists of um, a model cocoa farm, 
It has a post harvest processing facility showcasing the best practices of how to do this thing correctly. We have um, a chocolate producing facility, a pilot chocolate producing facilities. We have business incubators and technology incubators to support these emerging small chocolatiers to become businesses. Because you know they, they, most of these chocolatiers, they know how to make chocolates, mm -hmm. but taking it to the next level to right. make, make them into businesses, mm -hmm. to be able to export into the market is, is another step. And, and the business and technology incubator, that's what it does. But more recently, you may have heard on the news that we are setting up a commercial chocolate factory that can convert 200 tons of our cocoa into value-added products. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is for the export market. So, um, so on the innovation center is about how do you build an industry and, and how can we help in training the small chocolatiers, the farmers, in improving their practices um, and uh, creating them into businesses that they can start exporting and so on. And, and that is the function of that outreach arm of the Cocoa Research Center. So that, that is the, the role of the center uh, that we do. But, it, but there are other roles of the ministry. Ministry provides the planting material to farmers right. at a subsidized rate. Um, so we have Trinidad selected hybrids, which are said to be very good varieties. They can produce about 2,000 kilograms per hectare. So they are very high, high producing varieties and ministry propagates them and gives it to farmers at $2.50 a plant. And these are one year old plants. So that, that, is, that is a tremendous opportunity for farmers to get these plants, the better, these better varieties and plant in their farm. The Cocoa Development Company is another company that is a special purpose company and, and they provide uh, support to the farmers by providing extension support and so on. So, the, so that is the ecosystem that is there to support and nurture the growth of this industry. Well, Professor and viewers and listeners, the, the presentation given thus far by Professor Uma Haran should have convinced you of one thing, the potential of cocoa production and, and the value added areas can transform Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean economically. And it supports the statement that I made in quoting um, Alpha Senon, that grass must become the new gas. Because when you look at the, the value of a ton of cocoa, as the professor said, of between six to 10,000 US, uh, uh, the price of a barrel of oil will vary well. At the worst end in Trinidad, it was US 9, and courtesy of the Russian European war, mm -hmm. it, it, it has risen above 100 US. So it means that the potential of cocoa production can easily surpass oil and gas production. So Mr. Senan is right. Grass must become the, the new gas. Professor, as you said, Trinidad Tobago, I think in reading, in the early 1900s, as you said, was the third largest producer. And, and at one time, I think they produced 20% of the world's cocoa. Exactly. And now, because of uh, the impact of uh, diseases, uh, the rundown state of uh, cocoa fields, et cetera, we are just producing 500 or 600 metric tons annually. Yep. So what more can the government of Trinidad and Tobago do to really help in revitalizing the cocoa industry, in your opinion? Okay, so, um, so we, at the moment, um, cocoa is produced in about 4,000 hectares of land, mm -hmm. right across Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, but there are about 50,000 hectares which are abandoned all over the place, right? Okay. So, um, so one of the questions is that uh, this 4,000 hectares that we have cocoa in, how do you increase the productivity? At the moment, they are producing on an average 200 kilograms per hectare, right. where the varieties we have can produce 2,000 kilograms per hectare. Mm -hmm. So we are producing, the efficiency of production is one-tenth of what, it, what we can get, right? So upgrading the existing facility is one. And then how do you expand it into those other 50,000 hectares which are abandoned land, which is the other question, right? Mm -hmm. So. This is where it comes in, investment. Where is the investment going to come? 
right? So the reason why you need a lot of investment is that we have about 100 years of abandonment. Right. Most of the cocoa estates have gone into secondary forests. Right. So it's a, it's, it's, um, a lot more expensive mm -hmm. to get these lands back into production. Because if, we, if it were already in good producing state, right. you yeah. know, it's easy to, 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 to get it. But so the investment is needed. So, so what we are trying to do, we have actually a project that is funded by IDB Lab, is to really build business models. Mm -hmm. Because investors are not going to be attracted to put money into a, a hole <laughs> that is going to really right, right. out all the money, their money, right? Correct. So you need to really build a business model mm -hmm. and to showcase to the investors there is money to be made. Right, and so that, that is what we are now doing. We are looking at estates, we have identified estates, and we are building a business model. So you, how, do you, how, how much money you can create? What is the investment that is required? Mm -hmm. What is the money that can be derived from it? Mm -hmm. And how long does it take for the money to be derived? And, and so on. And, and so we are trying to attract what we call patient capital. All right, all right. Because um, capital, most of the people, they put the money in and they want the money back next yeah, year, yeah, yeah. right? And cocoa doesn't grow in, yeah, 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 in a year, right? So yeah. you need to clear the lands, right, re-prepare yeah. the lands, yeah. plant shade trees right. and plant cocoa. And so it takes about five, six years. So you need yeah. patient capital. Yeah. And usually there, there's a kind of capital called impact investment. Mm -hmm. Impact investors are patient investors. They are right. more interested in the triple bottom line. They are not right. only interested in return on investments, right, right, right. but they are also looking at return on environmental returns. They are looking at right. social returns. Right. So creating business models yeah. that are economically viable, yes, right. but at the same time, they are also socially and environmentally conscious development right. will allow to attract that kind of investment right. that will allow the industry to grow uh, without having to uh, rely entirely on government. The right, government right. Uh, during the days of the oil and gas boom had it money, you know, and that right. time I think it was a mistake we have not invested. Correct. Yeah. But um, now I think it's a very lean period we are going through, so we cannot rely entirely on the government. The government has a sig significant role to play, right, right. but we cannot rely on government alone. Right. We need to try to get private capital. So that's right. one thing. What The second question you asked is that what can government do? So the government's role is to create the environment for investors to invest, right? So one is risk mitigation, right? You know, if, if there are problems of access roads, we have problems of forest fire, you have problems of water availability and so on, you know, um, um, electr electrification of rural areas, you know, so those are the functions of the government. So the government, uh, traditionally, in the old days, cocoa, the transportation was through donkeys, right? So you didn't need big roads, right, or you right, don't need. Right, right. But now, uh, now it's the days so of people don't want to use donkeys; they want to use ATVs, they want to use um, uh, vehicles, and so on. So you right. need better access roads. You need um, um, subsidies on these kind of equipment mm -hmm. because labor is very costly in Trinidad. So right. on one side, we talked about the high prices that we have. But on the other end, our cost of production is also high, and that is because of the labor cost is high, right. which is not bad because we need to pay persons in a um, good way right. so that you know they have a good living, right. the persons who rely on cocoa. Right. But at the same time, the labor productivity has to be increased, and mm -hmm. mechanization is one way to improve labor productivity, right. reduce the effort, and at the same time, increase efficiency. And, so how, how do you better mechanize those fields and so on? And, and those are some of the areas in which subsidies should be given to farms right. so that they can get their, uh, uh, increase the efficiency of production. So right. they reduce the cost, right. increase their prices, mm -hmm. and as a result, you know, you, you make better profits. And once farms become profitable, mm -hmm. investors will be crowding in because, right. you know, they, right they are looking for return on investment and right. this is foreign exchange right. earner right, right. so right. Right. lot of the a lot of the businesses locally they they they, they look for foreign exchange because they have to buy raw material yeah, yeah, yeah. to re-export back right? right so whereas here is a case where you can convert your local resources into foreign exchange mm -hmm. if you can get the efficiencies high enough mm -hmm. 
in terms of productivity on one end and reducing the cost of production by increasing the efficiency. So th that, that is a, that's why I think the role of research is critical and that is the function that we are trying to get this center to be able to do. Uh, how do we develop better business models? How do you increase efficiency at the farm level? How do you increase the output in the value added end? And how do you get these products into the market? And all of those requires research and development. Yeah. Well, Professor, based on what you have presented there, it, it, it is clear to me and I'm sure to the listeners and viewers that we need an extremely close working relationship with people in the field, practitioners, uh, researchers like yourself, governments, patient investors, right? Because I think we cannot operate in silos given what is required particularly to revitalize the industry and, and given the, the, the potential and, and how it can be maximized to push the country forward, I think we really have to um, identify, for example, investors who appreciate the, the, the vision mm -hmm. and educate uh, people into farming, educate the population so they can better see the, the value. I would say even at the government level, where the picture of you know, you know, where it could become a, a a powerful instrument to, to transform Trinidad and Tobago economically outside of oil and gas, because we have spoken about divesting the, the economy for years, and I think you know pushing the cocoa industry is, is certainly a, a, a important platform that can be used. So, have you have your center, um, or is the center aware of willing investors in, in the region, in Trinidad, in the world that will be eager or, or interested? Are you all aware of any yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, Trinidad is a good sell. I mean, Trinidad, um, once you have business models, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have no doubt uh, investors will be coming in. I mean, I, we know of two investors mm -hmm. who came in the past and uh, they were looking for land and they couldn't get the land right. or they couldn't get the partnerships in place in time. Right, right, right. And, and that's why I was talking about the ecosystem. Right, and right, and you, right. you mentioned it, you know, the ecosystem, because it's, we can't work in silos, right? right? Yes. Uh, so we have to build this ecosystem that is attractive. When, when an investor comes, they are looking for land, they are looking for uh, technical advice, uh, we, they are looking for investment banking advice, you know, so you, they are looking, and how do you really, I mean, the InvestTT is there, but InvestTT's main focus has been always in oil and gas at the mm -hmm. moment, but right. I think they, they should really get their focus into other uh, potential uh, divestment opportunities, you know, or better investment opportunities outside of the oil and gas sector, right. so that uh, we can grow that other side of the economy, right? And um, but getting that ecosystem right is what actually we are working on because right. we we have uh, an FAO project that is really trying to uh, create that ecosystem right. led by the government because mm -hmm. the government creates a vision right. and the policies and so on but then also supported by these institutions, the Cocoa Development Company, the right. Ministry of Agriculture right. organizations, and the Cocoa Research Center. Right. So that is very, very good, very, very interesting. Now, to, it, it appears to me that uh, there, there are many opportunities for professionals trained in the field in agriculture, specialized in cocoa, what have you, to do a lot, you know, in terms of the number of persons graduating from the university here, are you satisfied the numbers or the, in terms of uh, like convincing graduates from the secondary schools about the potential they get into this area, what they can do for them personally, what they can do for the country, how successful that, that has been? Yeah, and I, th I think, well, you, you will know that the, the, uh, about 20, when I started lecturing here, used to have about 150 students in agriculture. Right. Now we have probably about 25 students in agriculture. Right. So right. there has been a steady decline in interest. And, right. and part of that relates to the fact that the agriculture industry is not moving ahead. Right. Because when the agriculture industry engine moves, mm -hmm. it will take along with a lot of people, right? right? But when the engine is sort of stagnant, mm -hmm. not moving, you know, people are looking at it and saying, you know, where am I going right. in agriculture, right? right? right. So, so I think, um, so recently we had some investors who came in and looking at investment and, mm -hmm. and they identified three problems. Well, they said money they couldn't bring, 
right? right. So that's another. Right. But the three problems they said that there's no private sector services. Right. There's no proper technology transfer programs mm -hmm. from uh, universities down to the farms. Right, right. And third is management. Right. The management expertise has declined mm -hmm. in farm management. Mm -hmm. And without good farm management, you know, management is about how do you use your resources to get the product at the best price and so on into the market. Right. And that knowledge requires a lot of, um, and, and that, that, that area is lacking the fault. So the people who are managing the farms right. are in many ways traditional farmers, yeah, they haven't right, been right. trained right, and so on right, to become right, managers. Right, right, right. So I think that's a role that the university has to take, right. I think, yeah. uh, because uh, pushing students into that area is one, to right. support. Right, right. But what about the entrepreneurs on the ground? Right, right. Uh, and how do you lift them up, right, right, in terms of their managerial skills, right, technical right, skills, right, so right. that they can be better make the private sector work, you know, towards right. um, building. So I think we need the university's role is critical, right. one in really producing uh, to, uh, the, to drive that engine forward. Right. But the engine, to move that engine, we need to really train the right. private sector who is involved. Right, right. And one of the ways we are trying to do it is to build models. Because if there's a successful model, invest, investors will come in, right? right? Because at the time, you know, if you have a fail-fail model, right? Yeah, so right. The, they, they look at it and say, you know, oh, the farmer's not making money. Yeah. Why am I putting my money right, there? Right, right, right? right? But right, if you right. have a model that mm -hmm. makes money, right. then you can say that, okay, here, mm -hmm. and then this is making money. I'm going to right. follow, follow this. Right. I'm going to do the same right. thing, right? And, right, right. and so we are, we are, at the moment, we are trying to work with some of the more progressive farmers to right. build models right, good. and yeah, so that yeah. you know yeah that yeah. will drive investment and growth and, and so right. on right. so uh, yeah so the university question is very important right. but um, I, I know that some people th I, I, I heard one professor tell tell me a year ago if you double the capacity of university as to students the the industry will go much faster right mm -hmm. But I was saying that if there's no engine moving, you double the capacity, you have double number of double the number of unemployed persons, right? right. right? So, right. so you yeah. need to really drive yeah. the industry on one end yeah. while you create the cadre of persons yeah. who could yeah. support it. Right, so viewers and listeners, it is quite clear. We, we need to do a lot of work to, to get the abandoned estates into a state of readiness. We, we need to train existing um, entrepreneurs. I, I was speaking with uh, uh, one of the entrepreneurs in the industry. He told me there about 10 or 15 of them, you know, and he also emphasized what you said, you know, that our Trentario beans is one of seven in the world that mm -hmm. is used to flavor other cocoa products, all right? And it is a very high quality. You also said about the di diversity of mm -hmm. the whole you know, range of um, cocoa plants, etc. So when we add all of those ingredients together, we, we, in a, we have a, a base to build on, you know, and I certainly would like to, um, you know, emphasize and thank the professor for the work that they are doing in trying to build that ecosystem and in, in trying to um, upgrade, you know, farmers in, in terms of having increased production, more profitability, and opening the eyes of students who are training wider and those who might be interested at all, giving them that motivation, you know. So we need to do that at the level of students. We need to do it at the level of government so that, that those possibilities can be more clearly seen. Because if it is that we were once the third largest producer in the early 19th century, and we also produced 20% of the world's cocoa, and now we are far cry from that, certainly it's in our best interest to, to do better. So. Professor, I don't know if you have anything else to add, but you have said you have given my class and more already. <laughs> and you know, I'm very thankful for my own education, for the education of viewers and listeners across the world, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. We are sitting on a gold mine. But if you are not doing anything with the gold, it doesn't make sense that you even have a mine. So <laughs> we have a mine, a gold mine in terms of cocoa, and we need to do much better. Is there anything else you would like to add, Professor? No, that, that's about it, yeah. Thank you so much so, for uh, the interview. I think this is very important work you are doing, I uh, think, to take the information to the larger public. Uh, and I would like to congratulate you for what you are doing. Uh, so thanks a lot.
professor and viewers and listeners, those who are new to the channel, as we promise you, this year we're going to be bringing high-profile people. And, and if I use an analogy to cricket, what a better opening batsman than Professor mm -hmm. Yuma Haran to have started off the innings. And I know Sri Lanka at one time <laughs> was a powerful force in cricket. Might not be so much now, but they have that kind of tradition. So thank you a lot. And we ask those who are viewing what we are offering here to ensure that you hit the subscribe, subscribe button, like, share, and comment on this video. And certainly, as we go along, we will always invite the professor to add more knowledge and to, and to show us the possibilities that exist. So, Professor, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.